So I want to talk about two different things. Uh, the first topic I'm going to talk about are new theories of what happened before the Big Bang. Um, and this is an issue which I've been interested in for a while. I'm not a cosmologist, but through my science writing, I've been always uh, quite interested in cosmology. And then I'm going to use that as a stepping off point uh, in the second part to talk about this book that I've written, or at least some of the ideas in it, uh, The Constant Fire Beyond the Science versus Religion Debate. So I hope you'll excuse me. I've never given a talk on the uh, cosmolo this part of the cosmology before. This is based on an article I did for Discover Magazine uh, in, um, I think it was April of last year. And it's probably going to be the topic of my next book. So um, we'll see. As you can tell, already the first typo, uh, science mythology and the, the science versus religion debate. <laughs> Way to go. Yeah, proofreading. It's a great idea. OK, so I want to start off with this idea. Uh, this is my favorite quote by the poet Muriel Ruckheiser. The universe is not made out of atoms. It is made out of stories. And I think that's a really beautiful quote and says a lot about um, what I want to bring to you today, which is this idea of how science and its narratives, the stories that science brings, um, in many ways recapture something very ancient for us. And this is uh, mythology. And that in many ways, science serves as um, a mythological system for our modern culture, speaking to the deepest issues we can take on, and also um, creating meaning for us, setting our own lives in context. Science is not usually seen in this way, but I think this is really the direction that we have to go for a number of reasons. So what I'm talking to you about today is part of, a part of it is what I did with my sabbatical. I had a sabbatical a few years ago, and I wrote a book. And the book I wrote, uh, the goal was to find new perspectives on the relationship between science and spiritual endeavor. Notice I'm not using the word religion there, because religion connotates a whole lot of different things for people. It can be about power and about real estate and you know, a whole bunch of other things. What I'm really interested in is the, you know, the personal experience people have that leads them to either be religious or spiritual or whatever they want to call it. Okay? So that's one of the important differences for me. Now, why did I do this? It's because I'm really interested in the context of science, right? We live in a society that is saturated with both the fruits and poisons of science. Um, you know, climate change is, if you want, you need go no further than that. Um, and the traditional science versus religion debate, which is all about, you know, evolution versus someone's interpretation of someone's scripture, just does not exhaust or even get to really the depth and the richness of the possible relationships between science as a social practice and a means to finding some truth and what goes on in spiritual endeavor. So I'm just, I'm so tired of people yelling and screaming about evolution versus uh, uh, creationism that there's got to be more to, to be said about this topic. Um, so I'm interested in mythology, I'm interested in the long history, going back 50,000 years, of human beings' encounter with the world and their attempts to make sense of it. Um, and then, uh, along with that is a word I'm going to introduce you to today, a uh, horephony, a horephony, which is a place where the sacred manifests itself, where the sacred erupts into the world or erupts into our lives. Okay, so a little table of contents. It's always good to have a table of contents, know where you're going. So first, very short prologue on science and myth. And then I'm going to tell you about the Big Bang, which is our dominant scientific model for the creation of the universe. And then I'm going to show you that the Big Bang is in trouble right now, that we're kind of ending, we're at the end, in some sense, of the traditional Big Bang model for the universe. And then I'm going to tell you about ideas that are beginning to percolate around about alternatives, and particularly, in particular, ideas where you don't have a Big Bang, right? Where you don't have time suddenly starting, OK? Uh, and then. I will, um, uh, the, and the second part after we take our break, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions that you guys will have about the end of the beginning, that section, a lot of questions I have. Um, so, and, so we'll take our break, answer some questions, and then we'll go back to the science, myth, and religion part. Um, again, if you want more on this, there's an article I did, you can get it on the web, uh, from Discover Magazine, the April 2008 issue. The title of it was, um, the day before Genesis. And it was about both the Big Bang and these radical alternatives to the Big Bang. OK, so first of all, a little prologue to get us set. Um, mythologies, many people, when they hear the word myth, they think, oh, false story, right? Urban myths of some old lady putting their, you know, her, her dog in a, in a microwave to dry it off. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about. Mythologies are complete systems of, um, of uh, narratives that set human life into context, 
All right? So it's not just stories about God you know, doing whatever. Um, they're really much deeper and much richer than that. They were stories which would set um, the transitions in life that people went through in context, marriage, coming of age, um, old age. And in that context, it was also set in some sort of cosmic context as well. And so these myths were, you know, all embracing. And they gave human beings a sense of where they were against the broad background of um, cosmic history. So answering fundamental questions was always the prerogative of myth slash religion. All modern religions emerge from our mythic heritage. And in many ways, you know, modern religions still carry that mythic heritage with them. So the big questions, um, things like our origins, humans' relationship with the natural world, the existence of some absolute uh, enduring reality, and the eventual fate of all things, these were all places that human beings went to myth. They went to their mythological narratives. So these were sacred narratives. You didn't just hear, like, one of the things about mythologies is, like, it wasn't like the shaman would come along and say, hey, kid, you want to know how the universe began? You know, you only, these stories were only told at special times during the year in ritual, and they were meant to evoke a sense of the world's sacred character. We'll talk later on what I mean by sacred. But the world's sense of being more than just the day-to-day. -day. Um, so it's very important to understand that, that it's not, you know, mythologies, these narratives weren't just lying around. They were told at special times and in special ways to bring the experience of the world as being different than the day-to-day -day, uh, in, in people's, uh, into their experience. Now, in our modern and postmodern culture, these sacred narratives, I'm going to argue, have been replaced by scientific narratives, right? The origin of the universe, the origin of life, the origin of the human species, these are all the narratives of science. They have their individual research specialties, but overall, those specialties, those individual small stories about carbon dating or about you know, planet formation fit into a larger story, which is itself you know, hearkening back to our deepest mythological uh, roots. Okay? That's what I'm trying to show you, that science serves this explicit function. And I'm very aware of this because I write for the, the public. And I've become aware, as my, when my editors would say, wow, this story sucks, you know, <laughs> that I wasn't telling a story. I was just giving a bunch of facts. And until I learned that I had to present the story as a narrative and call back to people's sense of drama and, and um, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, um, connectedness, uh, that people wouldn't really respond to the story I was telling. Okay, so I just showed you this is a picture of Pangu, the Chinese creator god, and here is a picture of the cosmic microwave background, which is the echoes of the Big Bang, which I'm about to talk about. So, you know, sort of just images showing that difference between mytholo classic mythology and now um, the way science functions as myth. Okay, now this lecture, the next, you know, 20 minutes, I'm going to be talking really about the problem of time. Right? which is fundamental to human existence, because we're born, we live, and we die. Um, and uh, the origin of time is always something that, you know, in every mythology, plays a central role. Now, for scientists and philosophers, this has been an enormous question. It's only been recently that we have some scientific way of addressing it. And the questions about time that cosmology touches on is, you know, did, like in the Big Bang, time just started? Like, you know, God firing up his Porsche? I mean, where, how does that happen, that there's nothing and then there's the Big Bang? What came before the Big Bang? Um, does time repeat itself? Is it some kind of cycle? If the Big Bang's wrong, do you have some kind of you know, cyclical universe repeating itself? Why does time have a direction? You know, why are we aware of the fact that we're moving towards the future from the past? Right? We can't go, you can't unscramble an egg. Okay? That's a fundamental question in science that has to do with cosmology. Or is time an illusion? Is, do we think that we're moving through time, but that's just some uh, accident of psychology? All of these alternatives have been explored in mythology. The world's heritage of mythology has pretty much exhausted all the possible answers to this. And what you will see in scientific theorizing after they take the data is often a recapturing of some of those mythic themes. So there's a writer, a cosmologist, Marcelo Gleiser, who's written a bunch of really beautiful books talking about how the, you know, these various um, options for thinking about the universe have already been explored in mythologies. OK, so let's get to the Big Bang. So Big Bang, the Big Bang is a cosmological model. And the, what's interesting about cosmology is up until, you know, 100 years ago, it was purely the domain of philosophy. There was no data. There was nothing you could do about it other than, you know, sort of sitting around over a beer and thinking about, you know, how the universe began. But now, in the last, particularly in the last 20 or 30 years, it has become a precision science. And that is really extraordinary. And in that precision, 
we have actually gotten to the edge, in some sense, of the Big Bang. So let's just first talk about the Big Bang to begin with. Right, so what's the idea of the Big Bang? Well, this is, first of all, our standard cosmological model. It has had enormous success um, as a way of explaining the data about the universe as a whole. Um, and the idea is that the universe began as a single compressed geometric point which, quote, unquote, exploded. Okay? <laughs> now, the thing to remind, that you have to remind yourself is it didn't explode into anything. It was all space, all time, all matter, all dimension. And what you had expl exploding was space itself, time itself, dimension itself. There was no, it wasn't like there was a shoebox of empty space that the Big Bang went off in. The, sh the Big Bang was the shoebox, okay? So there's no inside or outside. There is only the universe, only existence. Now, this explosion was tremendously hot and tremendously dense. And as the universe expanded, you know, like a balloon expanding, it cooled. And as it cooled, you went through a variety of physics transitions, which eventually leads to um, all the structure we see in the universe today. So the universe started out hot and dense and smooth and grew into galaxies and clusters of galaxies and clusters of clusters of galaxies and, you know, lumpy things like planets and people. Okay. So, and much of what the cosmological, what the Big Bang theory is about is articulating from the first point to the, to the third. Or really, from the third point, the explosion was tremendously hot and dense to how we got all the structure. And it's been incredibly successful in that way. So here's just a, you know, a representation of it. Um, you have the Big Bang happening here. The size of this cone delimits the size of the universe. So you see the universe started out very small. There was this period of rapid inflation called, a rapid expansion called inflation, which I will talk about. And then the universe just continued to expand. Uh, and as time went on, you got, you know, guests for first stars forming and then galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And here we are today, 13.7 billion years after the moment of creation. Okay? So that's a pictorial representation, which is wrong in the sense that, again, this sort of, you, it sort of makes it look like there's some outside. There is no outside. Okay? So this is just a convenient way of representing it. So how do we know this Big Bang is true? Right? I mean, if it's a scientific idea, it's got to have evidence in support of it. And uh, you know, thinking that you know anything about the universe at all is an extraordinary claim, so you better have some extraordinary proof to back it up. And there are three pillars on which classic Big Bang theory rests. The first is the expansion of the universe. We can see every galaxy expanding away from every other galaxy, right? That's for sure. And if you think about it and you run the movie backwards, if everything's expanding away from everything else, you run it backwards and everything you would think would be compressed if, you know, at some point, hot and dense and compressed. The other thing is the uh, abundance of primordial elements, things like hydrogen, helium, boron. You can make very explicit predictions that what came out of the Big Bang in terms of those elements, and it matches very beautifully. And then finally, and most importantly, there is what is called the cosmic microwave background radiation, which are fossil photons, fossil light waves left over from the Big Bang. And let me talk about that for a second, because it's very important. So this cosmic microwave background uh, was first predicted in the 1940s and 50s before anybody believed in a Big Bang. Um, and Ralph Alpher and his associates calculated uh, sort of asked themselves what would happen if the universe was dense and compressed. And what they figured out was um, this hot, dense universe should have emitted this very special kind of radiation called black body radiation. It is light that is connected with any kind of matter's temperature. So right now, all of you guys as solids with all of your atoms packed together are emitting black body radiation. Um, what you're most familiar with it, of black body radiation though is a red hot poker, right? If you take uh, an iron rod and stick it in a fire and you leave it there long enough, it'll begin to glow red. That is basically heat radiation, okay? So that red glow is coming about because the iron rod has been, um, uh, its temperature has been raised to the point where it's emitting and in, uh, most of its light where your eye can pick it up. On the other hand, right now, all of us, whoops, excuse me, all of us are emitting radiation. If you had an infrared camera, this room would look like this, full of, because all of us right now are emitting radiation. It's just that the radiation, our eyes can't pick it up. It's in the infrared part of the spectrum. So if you take an early universe, you take a universe that's hot and dense and compressed, it will act like this. It will produce its own heat radiation. And that is what is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And it was discovered um, back in the 1960s. And what they um, 
found was, so let me show you this. This is a map, imagine, but this is a map of the entire sky. So basically you take every part of the sky and you map it onto that oval, okay? And this is a map of this radiation coming from the Big Bang. And you'll notice, other than that little band in the middle, it's smooth, which is what you'd expect. If the, if the universe was a hot, uh, um, dense, uh, you know, mush of material, and it was all emitting radiation, then anywhere I look in the sky, I'm looking back in time to the Big Bang. So everywhere I look, I should see the exact same radiation. And so that's what I'm seeing there. This, that smooth green is basically the, the, that is the Big Bang, or at least not quite the Big Bang. It's about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. So that smoothness tells us that, yeah, I'm seeing all the way back to when the universe was essentially smooth and homogeneous and hot. This little band here is actually just the effect of the galaxy, of the Milky Way, the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. But now that wasn't enough for people, because people knew that, you know, right now the universe is all lumpy. So there must have been the seeds of those lumps even back then. The universe must have had these tiny, tiny ripples in it um, that eventually gravity got hold of and turned into galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So later on, around the 1990s, people sent up a satellite to start looking for those little ripples and this is what they found. So these ripples are actually tiny uh, perturbations in the density of the cosmic microwave background. So this, this little lump here is slightly hotter than the background. This little lump over here is slightly cooler than that background. And these are the things which, as time went on, gravity got hold of and started to pull inward. Anything that was a little bit denser than its environment, gravity started to suck together. And that's what built the first galaxies. Now, uh, a few years ago, they sent up an even better satellite that could see with even finer eyes. And you know, we were able to, all of this mottling here, these mottled blobs are, you know, this is the initial perturbations, the initial ripples that turned into you and I, essentially. Um, and you can do an enormous amount of science with those ripples. You can do all kinds of statistics and really see whether or not your model, this is the precision part, really see whether or not your, your, your Big Bang model makes sense, okay? And so that's what happened. Since the 2000, 2000 or so, um, uh, people have been doing very high precision uh, observations of this echo, these echoes. We're basically hearing the echoes of the Big Bang, and in listening very carefully, we're able to test our models. And in testing our models, we found a major problem, okay? Those ripples are too uniform. And what, that, what do I mean by that? So if we go back to this, you see that pretty much, you know, if I look at a chunk of sky over here and I look at a chunk of sky over there, it looks different, but, you know, statistically, actually, it looks the same. So the number of ripples over here, number of bumps and wiggles, is about the same thing as the bumps and wiggles there. So why is that a problem? Well, you know, on that map, I'm looking at either that part of the sky or that part of the sky, right? Two opposite ends of the sky. And the ripples are the same. Now, that doesn't make sense for what we understand about how the Big Bang grew. Because what it would mean is, is that that part of the sky and that part of the sky, if I run the clock backwards and I see how those different parts of space, um, I run it back to when the, those photons were created, they weren't anywhere near each other. Okay? So why should the conditions here and the conditions there, if they're so far away that they couldn't exchange a light wave, why would they be the same? It's like opening up the newspaper and finding the temperature in every city in the world is exactly the same. Everybody's 60.2 you know, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Right? It just doesn't make sense. They're not in contact. Okay? So something must be wrong with the Big Bang because if not, somehow I have a miracle occurring that parts of the universe that never saw each other, never were in contact, never shared information, seem to have the exact same conditions. So this really bothered people. There were other things going on, but this, they call it the horizon problem or the smoothness problem. And the solution people came up with was to invent a new part of uh, something. They added something to the Big Bang, which is what is called inflation. And the idea was, OK, in the standard Big Bang model, these two different parts of the sky are too far away from each other. So let's imagine that earlier on, something must have happened where the, they were close to each other, right? They were overlapping. They shared information. Stuff could pass back and forth. And then there must have been this really rapid period where the uh, universe got stretched. It was sort of in, uh, expansion on steroids, um, where the universe was rapidly pulled apart. And then it went along and started expanding as we see it now. So this period of inflation was occurred at, at, look at this number, 10 to the minus 33 of a second after the Big Bang. 
right? That's like, you know, that's a bare instant after the moment of creation. Um, and what happens in inflation is it doesn't take the whole universe, it takes a little piece of the universe. So you have the Big Bang and space and time emerging, but you take a little piece of the universe that's everything share, you know, connected, and then you take that little part and allow it to inflate. So you have a little piece, a sliver of the universe that blows up and becomes everything we see. So what that means is our universe, the visible universe, is not the whole universe. It's only the part that inflated. So there's all this other universe out there that who knows what happened to it, okay? So the rest of the universe goes along its merry way where our little fraction of the universe went through inflation and became everything we can see today. So the question is, well, is that the end of the story? What about the rest of the universe? And that's one of the things you're going to see me talking about, okay? <laughs> all right, so um, just to put too fine a point on it, this is the idea you have the Big Bang, you have an enormous increase in the size of the universe, that's the width here is the size of the universe. And then eventually, after inflation, the universe goes along its merry way, expanding slowly, and you get all these different transitions, galaxies forming, the modern universe, etc. Okay. So where are we right now? Well, Big Bang cosmology right now uh, is basically was rescued by inflation. Without inflation, we would not, cosmology wouldn't work, and we'd be in trouble with it. Um, but the problem is you pay a price for inflation, which is that basically the universe we see is not the whole universe. There is much more universe out there that we don't know what happened to it. Did it inflate? Didn't inflate? Um, and no matter what, we still have the problem of a beginning, <laughs> right? There's still t equals zero. And every time I teach the course with cosmology, you know, some student raised their hand and said, but professor, what happened before the Big Bang? Right? And I come up with some crappy answer about, well, it's all space and all time. You can't ask that question. But the answer is nobody really knows. Right? People don't know what to do with the beginning. Um, and that's uh, one thing to note, an historical note, is that before there was the Big Bang, there was something called the steady state model, which acknowledged that, yeah, yeah, the universe is expanding. Um, but probably what's happening is you're constantly maybe creating one atom every you know, parsec. And that's enough to continually create enough matter that the universe will always expand, but it'll always look the same. So people didn't like the idea of a beginning, and they got away with it for a long time with the steady state model. <coughs> Nobody likes the beginning. How are you supposed to decide? When did the, you know, who decided that the universe was supposed to start at that point, right? I mean, was there time beforehand? It just, it, you know, does a lot of damage philosophically to your imagination to suddenly think that space and time and matter and dimension just start, okay? So people would like to get away from the beginning if they could. Um, there's also this problem that at t equals zero, all of our laws of physics basically go belly up. They roll over on their back and they wiggle their legs in the air. It's what's called a singularity. The compression is so intense at a singularity, this is the same thing that happens in a black hole, that we just don't know what to do. So, um, uh, so you know, people have been trying to understand the singularity and also in, uh, in hopes of getting away from the beginning. So I'm going to show you now three models, three different ways of getting away without an origin of the universe. Okay, I'm going to go through them briefly, because that's all I have time for, um, but just to show you that they're out there. None of these are proven yet, and I'm going to go from sort of well-founded to completely wacky. All right, so why is there a beginning? Well, one of the, uh, the first model I'm going to show you is the cyclic model um, uh, by uh, Neil Turek and Paul Steinhardt. And to understand this, you have to imagine, so what they want is a model where the universe expands and contracts, expands and contracts, but it doesn't look like anything you might expect. Um, so what you have to do to understand this model is imagine that the universe has more than three spatial dimensions, okay? So imagine that our three-dimensional world is more like a sheet of paper in, uh, you know, in a room, right? So imagine that our universe is two dimensions and it's embedded in a three-dimensional space, right? So if the whole universe was two-dimensional, we'd be living on the surface of the sheet of paper, but the sheet of paper could bend and fold and there could be other sheets of paper, other universes that could smack into it. Um, so that's what the, the idea they started with, that our 3D world is really more like a sheet or what they call a brain, a membrane, in a higher dimensional bulk. Um, and there could be other sheets moving around in the bulk. And if you get collisions between these, uh, these sheets, um, then when they collide, there's so much energy in it that it could make things start to happen that will yield the universe we see. So let me show you. And they have a book out, if anybody's interested in this, called The Endless Universe. So let me just show you. Um, this is what they mean by this. So this, imagine these are, these, these are two dimensional representations of two three dimensional worlds embedded in a four or five or six dimensional space. 
And then what happens is, is that forces between these sheets draw them together, the sheets ripple, enormous energy is released when they smack into each other, and in that energy that's released, you start creating matter, and the matter starts clumping together and forming, um, so you can see galaxies forming, and it also takes each one of those sheets and makes it expand. So everything that you get from the Big Bang, you can get from these colliding sheets. So this idea of membranes uh, embedded in high dimensional spaces, that there's really much more to the universe than just our three dimensions, is the basis of this idea. So what you have basically, so here's a representation, there's a nice Discover Magazine article you guys can find on this, of the cyclic model, is that you start off with uh, two sheets, let's see, where do we start? Um, you start off with two sheets that collide into each other, that drives an expansion uh, and the creation of matter. The sheets expand, 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 until basically the universe is empty. Both sheets are empty because everything is so spread out. Um, and you have an infinite space to do this. And then basically when they're uh, flat again, when the sheets are, have no more matter in them, they get drawn back together and that starts the process again. So you have a collision between the sheets, a repulsion of the sheets. Each sheet goes through its own expansion. A sheet is really a three-dimensional world. Um, and then an attraction and you repeat this process infinitely. Okay? Now one of the interesting things about this is if you have an infinite number of cycles, does that mean that all of us have done this before, right? An infinite number means every configuration of atoms is possible, has already happened. So we've all sat in this room before at some other cycle of the universe. Okay, so that's crazy idea number one. Crazy idea number two is, is a cosmological idea that gets at the idea of why does time have a direction, right? So just as an example, when you think about time having a direction, you know, you know if you take an egg and you break it, you know, and crack it into pieces and make an omelet with it, you can't undo that. Right? If I, if I hit pool balls on a table and I take a movie of it, you can't really tell. If I showed you the movie backwards or forwards, you wouldn't be able to tell which direction. That's an example of where, you, you know, time doesn't seem to have an arrow. But in the real world or in more complicated systems, um, when I have lots and lots of pool balls, meaning atoms, um, there's clearly a, direct, a forward direction of time. And this bothers a lot of astronomers and physicists. And so the question of why is there an arrow of time uh, is a major issue. So uh, this is the second idea going beyond the Big Bang. It's what's called the steady state multiverse. The first one was that cyclical universe and the colliding brains. This idea uses inflation, okay? And it takes the idea that, well, okay, our universe was one little sliver of the post-Big Bang world that inflated, right? So the question is, what happened to all the other space? People very re quickly realize that, well, if it happened to our part of the universe, our little sliver, other slivers should be um, being created going through inflation as well. So what you imagine is, out of the Big Bang, you got many pocket universes. We are just a pocket universe. Each one being inflated out of the background, each one completely disconnected from all the others. Um, and so what you have is not a universe, but a multiverse. A universe of pocket uh, universes, all of which inflated out of this background. And each universe has its own physics and its own fate. The physics may be different in the different universes. We have four fundamental laws, gravity or forces, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear force. Other universes may have five or ten. It can just be totally different. So Sean Carroll took this idea of what's called eternal inflation. Inflation is always going on. New universes are always being born. And he asked himself, how can I make a, a, a total cosmology where there's no arrow of time? And this is what he did. Um, the question, of course, is why does time run forward? Well, there's this thing called entropy, which the direction of time is intimately connected with. And what it happens is, is that, in general, if you take a system and just let it go, the entropy of a system, which is a measure of its disorder, always increases. Okay? And it'll increase until a point where you reach equilibrium. Um, and that occurs when there's maximum entropy. So basically, you take a hot mug of coffee and you leave it alone, right? And what happens? Its temperature goes down and down and down until it comes to room temperature and it stops evolving. So evolution and the movement of entropy are intimately related. The movement of time forward and the increase of entropy are intimately related, okay? So, but here's the question. Our universe is clearly evolving, right? Our universe started in one state and it's now evolving. So it must have meant that at the beginning of the universe, it was in a very low entropy state. Because if not, nothing would have ever changed. So our universe started in a low entropy state. Has it been an increasing entropy since then? Um, and that's part of its evolution. But the question is, why did it start off in a low entropy state? Um, you know, there's an infinite number of ways the universe could have begun, and most of them are high 
Entropy, most of them have no evolution. Most of them are equilibrium. The low entropy state is the rare one, like one part in 10 to the trillion. So this bothers people because it means that was the universe fine-tuned somehow to evolve, right? If you have 10,000 marbles and they're all white and you reach in and grab the black one, you know, you wonder, like, whoa, what went on? That's really improbable. It's very improbable that the universe should have started in a way that there could have been a forward direction in time. So Sean's so, a solution to, for this was to use inflation. And he imagined that you can always start off with some region of some universe that is empty, nearly empty. And then you get a little uh, uh, quantum fluctuation, and you start getting inflation. So what he says is, look, inflation is not about the Big Bang. Just take any empty space and allow you know, some kind of energy field to go through some fluctuation, and you'll start that piece of the universe inflating. And it'll go through the usual thing. It'll create stars and galaxies, and those stars and galaxies will expand. And eventually, space will become so spread out that eventually you end up with empty space again. And that empty space can once again through an, go through another you know, quantum fluctuation and start inflating. So inflation is not about, so you don't need a big bang, just take empty space. And when you take that idea and put it together with the multiverse, then you get something very interesting. Because the process can occur in either direction relative to the multiverse in terms of time, right? So in some pocket universes, so imagine you've got this entire multiverse and you're God, and you can see all these universes sprouting and growing. Um, and you know, you've got your God's pocket watch, and you're saying, OK, that's you know, t equals 1, t equals 2, t equals 3. Um, and you're watching these different universes evolve. What it turns out is that some pocket universes will run forwards in time relative to the whole. Some pocket universes will run backwards in time relative to the whole. But overall, it's a steady state. So you constantly have universes that are heading into the future and other universes that are heading into the past, but they all will, uh, on average, um, it'll all look the same. So you'll constantly have things happening, but any time you look, it'll always look the same. So here, you have no overall arrow of time. Only in each individual pocket universes can you define this is the past and that's the future. Overall, everything you know, pretty much looks the same at any time. OK, so that's a pretty wild idea, right? I've just thrown two wild ideas at you. First, that the universe is you know, part of some, uh, that there are many three-dimensional sheets bumping into each other. Here I've got the idea that there's infinite numbers of universes popping off all the time, some moving in the path, into the past, some moving into the future. Here is the really weir weird idea, which is, does time exist at all? Right? And this is, you'd think, it would be a philosophical question, and it is. But there is one physicist in particular who's a really interesting guy, uh, Julian Barber who um, basically was heading towards a very prestigious career in physics, started getting involved in this question of, is there time, and said, you know, I'm never going to be able to answer this and have an academic career, dropped out of physics, became a um, translator of Russian texts, lived very meagerly on a house in Sussex, uh, and spent 30 years trying to work this out. And the s conclusion he came to was, in, it, it was in this popular book, The End of Time, but there's a whole uh, bunch of scientific papers he did. Um, and his idea was this. We never see time, right? What we see is change. So we think of time as the measure of change, but he says, I want to abstract away everything I don't actually see, and I never see time. You know, I try and grab it, and it just slips through my fingers. And so what his uh, conclusion was when he did this was that time doesn't exist. Time is actually an illusion. And you're going to see his, his, um, uh, his solution was really amazing. So all the nows always exist simultaneously, if you can use that word simultaneously. The nice way of saying this is the cat that jumps is not the cat that lands, OK? So this is a now. And you think about the, you know, here's the cat looking at the, whatever, the little frisky bits, right? But this, is, you know, this moment is frozen and eternal. Everything in the universe is frozen and eternal. There's no movement. And then this moment is a separate and distinct now. This moment is a separate and distinct now. There's not. There's no flow here from one to the other, OK? And he's worked out the physics of this. Um, and his idea is that all of these nows uh, exist in what he calls platonia. You know? It's a configuration space. It's a space of all the possible nows. Um, and there is some sort of structure in the ways the nows are arranged. So if you could look at this platonia, you'd see it's not just randomly distributed. Some nows, you know, you could, it's almost like there's almost like a, a spider web of nows that some are connected to each other in the sense of there's a physics of linking one now to the other. The way, you know, the beam in that building, the top beam is linked to the beam underneath it, okay? One beam doesn't follow from the other, but they're, you know, they're located next to each other in space. And that's what he's imagining. And so there's never any change. There's no flow of time. 
And memory, what we think of memory, is really an illusion based on the physics of these different nows. Okay? It's about the arrangement in Platonia. So imagine you take a novel, right? And you've got all the different pages in your novel, right? And in, in the novel, they're all lined one after the other. So if you read the pages, it seems like there's a story. But you could rip all those pages out and just throw them on the floor. And then there'd be whatever arrangement there was, right? And one page wouldn't necessarily flow from the other. The nows are like those pages in the book. The physics of Platonia, of this space, is that, yes, some, one page may exist next to the other page in Platonia, but it's not like one follows from the other, because there's no time. Think of the integers, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Five doesn't, you know, it's not like five comes after four in time. Five is related to four in a progression, but you know, it doesn't flow, four doesn't flow into five in time. That's the way he's imagining the Platonia. And in that sense, the Big Bang is not a beginning in time, it's just a very special place in Platonia. Okay? So this idea has actually, um, you know, it's radical, but there's a lot of physics behind it, and he's gotten a lot of attention for it. He's, he's quite an interesting guy. So what I want to do now is stop here, right? Because I've just presented you with like, you know, a mouthful of uh, weird ideas, and I thought maybe we could take some questions now on just the cosmology part, and then maybe uh, go on to the, 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 the myth part. So, yeah. Um, if I as a collider in virtual campus connected to the Big Bang through the search of the Big Bang? Yes, they are, but here's... Okay, the question was, are the colliders, like the Large, large Hadron Collider, which just turned on and then turned off, um, connected to the theories of the Big Bang? And the answer is absolutely, but it doesn't get to any of this. At the best, it gets... Let me go, just go back to that movie. Okay, so this movie. The colliders at their best are going to get us somewhere, I don't know, somewhere around here, not even to where inflation starts. So, you know, the actual Big Bang itself or even the physics of inflation, we don't have any means of directly testing in the laboratory. We have to hope that astronomy and, like, the cosmic microwave background can give us clues to it. So. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, well, that's actually depends on which. Oh, the question was, can we define? Can I define time? That is exactly the issue. Is how how you define time de determines how you define physics, right? Because that's really one thing I didn't. I, I talked a little bit about the singularity at the beginning of the Big Bang. Um, we can't go after that. We can't understand what happens when the universe is so dense and compact. Um, without having a theory of quantum gravity, a theory that relates um, Einstein's theory of relativity with particles and what happens on the subatomic realm. But we've, after 30 years, we've made no progress. String theory, some of you may be familiar with, it's got a lot of press. Right now, I think string theory is sort of stalled. I mean, some people may, you know, would throw you know, eggs at me. I'm not a string theorist, but just looking from a distance, string theory has not lived up to its reputation. We still don't have, we're nowhere near a theory of quantum gravity, a universally accepted. And that may depend on exactly what you're saying. Define time. What, does, how does, what role does time play in change? Barber's answer is there's no time. He says, you know, we're completely off base with our thinking about time. So, you know, it, and, and physics has gone through some radical transformations, right? Newton, for time for Newton was this river that flowed everywhere, all through space, all at the same rate. Einstein came along and said, no way. Space and time are intimately connected, and how you're moving will, depend, will determine how your clock flows relative to mine. So we've gone through these redefinitions, and right now it looks like we may need another very radical redefinition of what time means. So. Yeah? Wait, back to the Large Hadron Collider? Yeah. So if it's only going to get us back to the orangey zone there, um, or yellow. Orangey yellow. Is it still worth it? Are we still excited about it? Yeah, because it's still... Uh, the question was, if, if the Large Hadron Collider is only going to get us to this region, whoops, stop doing that, is only going to get us to here, why are we excited about it? Because we don't, you know, we still don't understand here, right? I mean, there's still lots of open questions about all of this that we can't, that we don't know. And it's possible, that one of the things the Large Hadron Collider may do is, well, for example, like, okay, here's a huge question which I didn't touch on. 97% of the energy and matter in the universe is in some dark form, is in, which basically means we have no clue, right? 97% of the stuff in the universe, we have no idea what it is, right? So all of you, you look at your hand and all the stuff that makes up your body is a tiny fraction of 
the matter and energy in the universe. I mean, we're barely part of the universe at all. It's not that the universe is really big and we're really small. It's like we're not even there. We're not even, you know, we're not even included hardly. Okay, so you know when you look out at the night sky and you see all those stars and galaxies, that's the pond scum floating on top of the dark ocean. Okay, so you know hopefully the Large Hadron Collider is at least going to tell us something about you know what those dark matter particles might be if they exist. It could be when we say dark particles that actually we're clueless. There's no dark matter particles at all. Okay, so I think that's why still it's you know there's a lot of science to be learned from that. But these ultimate fundamental questions. You know, we're going to have to turn to the sky itself to tell us if if that's possible. Frank, yes. He has a question. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'd have to. <laughs> I mean, it's like theater in the round. You know. So, I'm just curious on this mapping. Why do you need inflation? Why do you just push the time back? I uh, mean, in all honesty, you, you have something you know, somewhat linear, logarithmic, in a logarithmic scale, but. Because the timing actually is very, if you push the whole thing back, there's all these sequences of phase transitions that happen here. Um, oh, the okay, the question was, why do I need inflation? Why can't I just have this thing continue going all the way back? Uh, you know, but the problem is if you do that, there's all these, it's all these phase transitions. Like, you know, the, you get um, the, the basic energy matter turning into quarks, and the quarks freeze out into hadrons, and, and, and if you, you'll, you'll change that dynamic if you try and extend it all the way back. It, it'll take too long. You'll have too much time back there, and things would have happened earlier. So it throws, it throws there's a clock, basically, in the Big Bang, um, or it, you know, in the particle physics. And if you were to try and extend that all the way back, you'd throw the clock off. And all of our, all the great stuff, all the great predictions we can make of the cosmic microwave background radiation, which happens here, depends on what's happened here and happened there. So that's what I mean about precision cosmology, is that we've got, there's, there's, there's the things we do understand, we understand really, really well. And you would have to work very hard to come up with an alternative model. Yes? I have a question about Barber's model. Uh, so if, if time is essentially does not exist, we at least have an illusion of time. How does he account for the notion, of, for the fact that there is a human perception of change in time, and the fact that you know either we we have a shared transition from these moments from from one now to another in yeah. an unbroken sequence, or the solipsistic notion that you know one of us there's there's only me. Right. So the question was, how does Barber, how does Julian Barber and his idea that there's no time at all deal with the fact that we, we have memories, right? And we, you know, right, I can remember when I walked in this room. His, you know, his solution to that sounds kind of crazy, but, you know, actually, you know, you can draw a lot, bunch of interesting distinctions about it. His idea is that the now right now, you know, your, has, your memories are basically just an arrangement of neurons, right? Just like a fossil is an arrangement of rock. And he says, it's the physics of these nows that has these, he calls them time capsules, things that have impressions that appear to you know, link them to previous nows. But it's really the physics that shapes each now. And he, like he said, some nows are related to the other, not as a flow of time, but in you know, the, the physics of this now in Plutonia and that now in Plutonia are such that this one will have a, you know, will have a or your neurons will be configured to have a certain state that uh, such that at this now, you have what appears to be a memory of an earlier now. Then why does there need to be more than one now? Because every different, because every different now is um, a, a, a different arrangement, right? I mean, that the, the now with your neurons remembering 10 minutes ago is a different arrangement because also the atoms in the world are in different places. Because it's not just about you, it's but about the rest of the universe. It's simply a construction of the, the now that we're in, right. the, of the given now. Right. Then why does, why does that memory actually need to exist as an independent now, as an independent construction? Well, again, first of all, I mean, since there's more in the universe than just your memories, right, it's clear that the rest of the universe has different configurations, right? The moon is in a different place, uh, you know, in this now than in the now next door in Plutonia. And so... Well, that's, that's what I remember, but... Well, he's taking, yeah, but he's taking it as being a, a real fact. He's taking those different nows. The, you know, what he means by now, it's the arrange. Every different now is the arrangement of every atom in the entire universe. And so since different nows have different observations of different locations of those atoms, um, you know, they, they must be different. But, it, I mean, you know, you could try and configure a model like that, I guess, if you wanted. But then that would be, that would be very centered on, on just observations. Right. So he's taking the real world to actually exist. 
in some sense. Yeah. But I, I listen, I'm just speaking for him. It's no, not my I, theory. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is there a difference between physics and philosophy with lots of math? Uh, that is a very good. So the question was, is there a difference between physics and philosophy with a lot of math? Right? Is <laughs> Basically, is all this stuff, some of these ideas I'm giving you, you know, because it's untestable right now, is it just basically, you know, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Now, that lead, that, there's a really interesting question that comes from that. Because, like, let's just take eternal inflation, right? Which is this, forget about any of these other ideas, but just the idea that, you know, there was the, the Big Bang, and then there, uh, many pocket universes have emerged from that, right? Now, we need, in order for the Big Bang to be true, we need inflation. You cannot have the Big Bang without inflation. But with inflation naturally comes this idea of eternal inflation. So what do you do with a theory that explains what you can see, but as part of it, you also get 50 million other universes that you can't see? You know, what's their status? Like, you really want to keep your theory because it's doing a great job of explaining things, but part of its consequences are, all these other universes. So, you know, your question takes it one step further, but I'm even, even in a place where we have a theory that has connection to uh, observations, because inflation has, there's some good evidence for inflation now. I mean, not good, it's, it's preliminary, but at least there is some observational evidence about inflation. But what do you do with these extra invisible universes that come along with it? So, um, so to, my feeling is you, you have to do this. You have to do this work. And you have to look for, because you never know, maybe in five years we'll find, maybe these universes can talk to each other. Maybe, you know, there's ways of doing experiments that I would actually, you know, be able to indicate or get some signal from these other universes. So right now it's, you know, right now it seems like just pure philosophy, but, and if it just stays, if there's never any connection with observations, then yeah, probably it'll, it'll be more abundant. And after a while, people won't, you know, study it anymore. Yes. You. Oh, okay. Well, uh, that's, that's a good question, and, the, and the, the answer to that is, oh, I'm sorry, right, yes, thank you. The question was, why do we need, why do, why are we, why do we concern ourselves with entropy in the universe? Why, why isn't it, you know, I, I think you're talking about why don't we just say there's equilibrium, and the equilibrium always existed, and... Why, why, how do you reconcile those two, because they seem separate to me, that there should also be a, a starting point, and simultaneously entropy existing everywhere. Well, this is the problem. You've nailed the problem. So w why should there be, uh, wait, could you say it again? Just, I want to, you formulated it nicely. Sorry. Um, how, do you reconcile how do you reconcile the theory of entropy, the theory of entropy with the need <laughs> with, for a big bang? With the need for a big bang. This is just like when Obama did the, uh, you know, I'm going to screw it up, right, when he did the, um, uh, the <laughs> inauguration. <laughs> um, okay. The reason, two reasons. We know that the entropy is about thermodynamics, right? It's about your coffee cups and, you know, um, your, you know, uh, uh, what, uh, you know, um, somebody give me another example of thermodynamics. The bedroom getting too messy. The bedroom getting too messy. Thank you. Yeah, you know, disorder, why it's hard to park. No, but th so thermodynamics, your car is a beautiful example, the heat engine in your car. Um, so we see the world has this process. Of, um, of thermodynamic evolution, and we have the laws of thermodynamics, and now we want to try and put them into the context of cosmology. And that's been one of the problems, is trying to merge what we know about thermodynamics and the, how the collections of large systems behave and how they, you know, how they evolve, and the fact that these systems are embedded in the universe. And what I observe about the universe is that it started, it must have started in a low entropy state because it's been evolving, right? I mean, the fact that I can look back and see that the universe was in a different state 13 billion years ago than it is in now tells me that, you know, the universe has been evolving. So I did not start anywhere near that dynamic equilibrium. So that forces me to say, like, why, right? I, I've got to take the laws of, of thermodynamics and entropy that I understand from in this room and try and apply it to the universe as a whole. But in the multiple theory universe, right, where you have all your sheets floating right. around, Well, no, actually. Where does it, why does it need to start someplace? 
Okay, that one doesn't need to start any place because there, what the idea? She was asking, like in the in the um, uh, the um, uh, steady state multiverse model, where I had universes p inflating all the time, some moving forwards in time, some moving backwards in time. Um, you know, why why there do I need to think about um, entropy? And the idea there is, I'm you. In fact, what I'm doing is I'm getting around my problem of having to have a low entropy state for the entire universe by now having lots of universes happening all the time, going off all the time. And what it, and, and from what I get from that is that. At any one time, if I look at it, I see things happening. And if I look a little bit later, um, I see other things happening. But on average, it always looks the same. And what I get from that is I get around my problem of having to figure out how to make the universe in this super duper special state at the beginning. Because now I've got universes, there's always beginnings and there's always ends. Okay? So that's why, that's why Sean Carroll likes that idea. He's saying, look, I don't have to worry about the arrow of time because overall there is no arrow of time. I have so many universes that their evolution can go backwards and forwards. Yes. Okay, one more, and then I guess we'll take a break. Okay, so, um, it, so I thought there was also like another uh, idea about you know the beginning, the Big Bang, is that you know it's sort of we are in a space time, a four dimensional space time, and you know just like the Earth, if you look at it two dimensionally, you can go on forever. If if you look at the Earth three dimensionally, it's quite bounded into one you know three dimensional spot. Right. Um, that idea doesn't work for time, or at least it has. Uh, okay, the question was, um, people have, sorry, uh, you know, some people have imagined the idea of the universe being bounded, uh, like, a, like a surface of a, of a balloon or a basketball. And, you know, in that case, if you head off in that direction, you eventually come back from that direction. Just like if you, you know, walk on a basketball, you'll eventually come around. That only works for space. So that's only true of the space. The time part, time, space and time are united, but they're still different. Um, and you can't loop the time back the way you can loop space around. So it's, people have never been successful. People tried to do sort of things like that, but you end up with problems in causality, right? You know, you want uh, causes to lead to their effects. Um, and if you have a loop like that, you end up with all kinds of logical paradoxes about what, what caused what. So, okay. So myth, as I talked about mythologies, right? There are these stories that um, create meaning. Um, now, these mytho mythological narratives were always about the sacred. They're always about evoking the sacred. And what do I mean by that? Um, well, first of all, let me just say, so myth is very old, right? You can go, you can trace the evolution of myth from the Paleolithic times 40,000 years ago all the way up to the modern, you know, the birth of uh, the major religions, in the, you know, sort of the, the 1,000 to 1, um, you know, right up to the, to the birth of Jesus. Um, so these narratives have always been with us, but... Uh, the thing about science that what I'm going to claim is, and I, I, especially since I do all these articles, is that you know the way we present science, the way we learn about science, often has all the trappings of myth in it. So I know this from right. That's a story I did. How to build a planet. You know, I had to include all kinds of details. You know, sort of making it seem like how a planet is born, its turbulent birth, its uh, you know uh, its eventual death. You know, telling it as a narrative. And what's really most important is if you look at how science comes to the public overall through schools or magazines or TV, it's always done in ways that instruct, enlighten, and most importantly, fill the listener with a sense of awe and wonder. If you ever watch a Nova special, listen to the music, okay? There's this evocative, swelling music that, you know, is supposed to draw you in. It's supposed to draw this feeling, this experience of awe and wonder before the story of the universe or of the origin of life that you're being told. And it's not a mistake. It's not, you know, it's not something they just added on. That was always part of the experience of the sacred. And so what do I mean by the sacred? Well, defining the sacred, you know, good luck, right? Um, but I use this word rather than spiritual or other things because the sacred is actually related to the architecture of temples, Roman temples. There was the inside of, of the temple, which was the sacer, and that's where, you know, you did your abulations. That was the, a space uh, for the gods. And outside was the profanum, which is where you could sell your walnuts and your T-shirts and everything. Um, so the interesting thing about this is the idea of a sacred being a place. The sacred is related to a space and a time 
when you know you have to be attentive to this other aspect of reality. So if you you know go and watch an IMAX movie about the birth of the universe and that huge screen and that swelling music, you're playing you know you're sort of set up just like someone 40,000 years ago around the campfire being told the story of creation. Um, because the sacred has always been with us. We can define it however we want, but it's that sense of the world being wholly other. So the space, sacred is a kind of time and space. And Mircea Eliade came up with the great word called horiphony. Okay? And the horiphony, you know what an epiphany is. A horiphony is the moment when the sacred erupts into our daily life. Okay? And Eliade did a lot of work with this and really thought about this. It's the idea of the horiphony is where the experience of the sacred is manifested. And I'm sure you guys all have some experience of this, right? You're doing the dishes, or you're, you know, and you're just like you're thinking about your day, and suddenly everything just is weird. You know, or you're taking a walk in the woods, and suddenly, you know, your usual day-to-day -day concerns about your job and your career and your kids who are driving you nuts drops away, and the moment, you know, has a clarity, uh, an illumination that, you know, is just startling. That is a horiphony. And the thing is, human beings have always had this experience, and they have built religions and mythologies to draw closer to that. And my claim is, is that science is... a plays the same role. That science both plays the same role. Um, science and its fruits are horiphonies, right? As I told you these stories about infinite universes and the, uh, the world without time, you know, the, in some sense, these stories can, if you're open to it, bring you to that experience as you walk out and get into your car of just sort of like, wow, you know, is there really time here? Is this just one now? Or, you know, just to even think about time as being something separate other than just using it for, you know, oh, I've got 15 minutes before I've got to get to work. Even that is a horiphony, to think, you know, and experience the world that way. So my claim in the book, and I work it out, I hope, you know, more than I'm doing now, is that science is a gateway to the sacred, okay? You don't have to define the sacred in terms of some divinity, some supernatural divinity. It's about the experience of the world, and science plays that role, okay? Now, we're used to this in art, right? Art as a horiphony, right? Whether the art is explicitly religious or not, right? These are the cave paintings, um, you know, Either way, we, we're used to going into a museum, the quiet of the museum, the reverence that we have for the, the paintings, and we expect we come in there receptive to that feeling, right? And my claim is, is that in science, you know, the same thing happens. We've just forgotten to label it as such. And in, these, in the imagined antagonism between science and spiritual endeavor, we've been taught, you know, like if you're having that feeling after, you know, you're learning about the Big Bang, oh, no, 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 don't have that feeling. That has nothing to do with science. And that is a mistake we've got to get away from. So the idea is that the fruits of science, whether it's an image of a, of a this is a, an image of the sun, uh, what will happen to the sun in five billion years, whether it's an astronomical image in the story of stellar birth and death that goes along with it, whether it's the story of life on the nanoscale, this is a virus, um, the amount, of, you know, the ecosystems in pond water, this is a single-celled animal, or even the mathematics for, that go behind electromagnetic waves like those coming out of this light here, all of them can serve as a gateway to the experience of the sacred, and that is a place where religion, broadly defined, and science come into an active and complementary, pa complementary parallel. And you know, this is not a joke. I mean, this is not just academic, right? We are basically, if you ask, you know, my opinion is we've got about a hundred years to figure this out, right? Figure out the project of civilization, because the degree to which, you know, the planet's not threatened. The planet will do fine. The, the degree, you know, to which our so, you know, our habitability of the planet is threatened is enormous. We're like a, a cosmic teenager, right? We've just been given uh, the keys to the planet and a fake ID, right? And the question is whether or not, you know, we drive the planet off the face of the, off, the, off a cliff or not. And it's all going to be all about, you know, not just the science we employ to get, get past global warming or energy. It's going to be about the values we choose in which science we deploy, and this, is this, this quote, I think, is important. Science and technology revolutionize our, revolutionize our lives, but memory, tradition, and myth frame our response. And I would put the sacred in there as well, because the sacred is what we value, and we act on what we value.